Hello and welcome everyone to our show today, this uh, live CCNA and CCNP routing and switching Q&A session. Um, this session is all about you guys. You have my undivided attention for the next hour or so in which you can pretty much pelt me with any questions you have related to the CCNA or CCNP routing and switching certification exams. I am here at your disposal. Uh, in the event that you have never taken a class from me or watched any of my videos, here is my intro slide so you can um, reach out to me at any point in time. Uh, I will try to take all of your questions today in, in the event that there's an onslaught of questions and I'm just not able to get to all of them during our session. Or if you stump me, and I actually don't know the answer either way, uh, you can reach out to me here. I, I'm giving you my email address, my Twitter account, and my LinkedIn account. Um, any of those methods are available for you to send a, a cashier's check in the amount of $5,000 and I will answer any question that you might have. All right, maybe not $5,000, maybe only $2,000. But that being the case, I'm going to go ahead and minimize this because that's pretty much it for our slides. I don't have any slides, like I said. This is all about you guys. Um, so, and yes, uh, CCENT questions, that sort of falls under the category of CCNA questions as well. So that being the case, let me go ahead and start at the top of the list right here and see what we've got. Let's see here. And yes, by the way, uh, you guys who are watching, if you see a question come in via the instant messaging there and you actually know the answer, feel free to jump in. In a, in a lot of these YouTube sessions, uh, I am blessed to have people who have a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience, who can actually help offload me by answering some of the questions. So feel free to lend your wisdom and insight and experience as well. All right. Uh, so, Salim, I'll go ahead and start with you. Uh, so you mentioned that you passed your CCNA and you're wondering how to start your CCNP. All right, good question. So for those of you who are unaware, the CCNP requires that you pass three certification exams. There is the route exam, the switch exam, and the T-shoot exam. Now, absolutely hands down, I and everybody else you always talk to will say that you should take T-shoot last. So that'll be the third exam you take. Now, as far as which one you take first, it's really up to you. Route or switch, route or switch it's, it's your own personal preference. Um, I would say that if when you started your CCNA, you knew pretty much nothing and all of the networking experience you've, you've gathered up until now has been purely from your CCNA studies, if that describes you, in other words, you don't really have any actual experience, then you probably want to start with switch, with the switch exam. Now, let me just show you what I'm talking about right here uh, to really reinforce this. So, let me go ahead and Cisco CCNP. So, if we get into here, you can see there are the three tests. Uh, they all begin with 300. Now, this is why I recommend that you start with switch rather than route if you don't have a lot of experience. Let me just go on to switch real quick. And I'm going to open up the blueprint. Let me make this a, a little bit larger here so you can see it. All right, so you can see with the switch blueprint, there's just basically three high level topics. Now, if I download this in PDF format, this is what I really want to show you. So notice, switch blueprint, two pages, two pages of PDF. All right, so keep that in mind. Now, we're going to go back and take a look at route. All right, so let's go back. Let's click on route. Review the exam topics. You can see there's, as opposed to three, there are six topics. You're starting to see where I'm going here, aren't you? So if I click on the PDF of this, hey, five pages of topics. So this is why I typically recommend that people start with switch versus route because I think there's just less that you have to learn. Uh, the route exam, you can see the blueprint is much, much bigger, you know, two and a half times the size of the switch blueprint. Now, if 
you do have networking experience. So let's say, for example, that you feel pretty good about routing, you know, uh, through your CCNA studies, through your on-the-job experience, whatever. Um, you feel pretty good about the stuff that's already in this route blueprint. You take a look at these five pages or so, and you think, hey, you know what, I, I think I feel pretty confident with the, about half of this or so, then by all means, start with the route exam. Um, but usually I tell people to start with Switch because Switch, as you can clearly see, the blueprint is a lot smaller, which leads me to believe that Switch is just an easier test to knock out on the front end. But it's really your own personal choice. All right, um, so Silas, you ask a question here. You said, are there any questions in the CCNP Switch exam related to IP SLAs, SNMP, NetFlow? And you're asking this because in the official 300-115, there are these topics. Uh, yes, there are. Uh, you won't get a ton of those questions, but I have seen questions on all three of those in the CCNP Switch exam. So you will want to study up on those three topics. All right, so what else have we got going on here? Let's see what other questions you guys have for me. So BV asked the question, what switch and router lab setup is needed for the CCNP exams? Good question. So the, if you've ever looked at INE's rack rentals, Okay, and, and yes, I am doing this as a shameless marketing plug, but in addition to that, there's more to it than that. If you go to our rack rentals, the, the CCNA and CCNP racks that we have, I designed those. I, I designed how many routers, how many switches, uh, what their connections would be, specifically with the idea of I wanted to create a single rack that I felt that you could adequately practice all the topics you would need to know for both the CCNA and the CCNP routing and switching. So, if you were going to create your own lab, I would say model it after what we have here uh, within our CCNA, CCNP racks here at INE. We've got three switches and four routers. Now, in addition to that, what you don't see, and let's see if I can, maybe if I scroll down here a little bit, yes, okay. Currently, with the CCNP route exam, it still tests you on frame relay as a topic. Frame relay was removed from the CCNA like two years ago, uh, but it is still in the CCNP exam, and it actually is a very big topic in the CCNP exam. I took the CCNP route a couple months back uh, just to refresh myself on what was on it, and I was shocked at the quantity of frame relay questions. Seriously, there's a lot of frame relay in there. So for that reason, um, in addition to our four routers here, we have two additional routers in our racks. And you would probably, if you're building your own rack, this means you're going to want a minimum of six routers. And this top router here, which is labeled as access server, that is also our frame relay WAN switch. So that router is acting as a frame relay switch and giving frame relay connectivity to routers one, three, and four. So you'll want some sort of router in your rack acting as a frame relay switch because you're going to need to practice that stuff. And this, this router here on the bottom, the Backbone Router 2, in our rack, if you were to log into our racks, you would not actually have access to that router. You couldn't get into it. You couldn't configure it. But what it's doing is it's pre-configured with VRFs and it's pre-configured with routing stuff. So it's like all, it's, it's constantly injecting RIP routes, uh, OSPF routes, and BGP routes into the four routers that you do have connectivity to. Um, because that way in some of our labs, for example, where you're doing route filtering, uh, route redistribution, where you're playing around with route maps, you've got some routes that are being injected by this router to practice with. So short answer to your question. Um, you would want a minimum of six routers and you will want them to have serial interfaces and this is one of the real big downsides of, of using uh, Cisco's viral solution. I was just playing around with that the other day. Uh, I'm very impressed with how they have streamlined viral. Viral these days is a lot easier and a lot quicker to get set up and working. I, I went to the packet.net website. I got a quick server for 40 cents an hour running there in like six minutes. And then I had viral up and working in like less than 10 minutes. It was super fast. Downside to viral is, on routers, all of your connections are Ethernet. 
there are no serial connections, so there is no way for you to practice frame relay. Um, so that is a, that's a downside to that. So uh, for CCMP route, you're going to need serial connections, which means you're either going to have to work with real equipment or you're going to have to work with GNS3. Those are pretty much your only two options. Um, Packet Tracer, which is great for CCNA, falls short for CCNP. A lot of the more complex stuff you'd want to do is just not available in Packet Tracer. So you'd want your serial connections, you want at least six routers here. And as far as switches, I think three switches would be sufficient and that would enable you to do all of your MST stuff. You know, make sure they're multi-layer switches. Another good, another good reason to have these switches is multi-layer switches, like I think we use 3560s, is that they can double as routers. So when you're doing your routing topologies, you can actually, like in this here, you can actually have seven routers, right? F four real routers and three switches acting as routers. And you can do BGP on these things. You can do OSPF on these things. You can do IPv6, EIGRP. So I would definitely recommend that you get multi-layer switches capable of routing and capable of IPv6. So a long answer to a, a very short question there. Uh, let's see here, what other questions do you have for me? Prem, your, your question is pre unfortunately sort of outside the scope of our class here. You're asking me to guide you for the CCIE lab. Uh, our session today is really focused on CCNA and CCNP. Now, if we run out of questions, I will be happy to try to, to help you with that. But for right now, I'm just going to skip past you because I really want to focus on the, the people who are prepping for their NAs and their NPs. And Randy, uh, you're going to be taking a CCIE boot camp from us soon. Great. Um, we're looking forward to seeing you. Do you have suggestions for la layer two labbing, viral, IOU, et cetera? Um, viral has come a long way. Uh, a year ago, I would have told you for layer two, switching stuff, viral stinks. It's missing all kinds of stuff. But like I said, I was just testing it last week. And a lot of stuff that used to not be available, like private VLANs, DHCP snooping, dynamic ARP inspection, all that stuff is in there now. So. I would say, um, well, you've got two choices. Um, with, with viral, if you're going to do viral, if you're going to do the Cisco viral personal edition, the PE edition, as far as cost is concerned, you're looking at a, at a minimum of a, of a $200 license, right? You got to pay $200 to get access to it for a year. And then if you're not going to install it on your own system, if you're going to install it on your own system, you have to have gobs of memory a lot of memory and a lot of CPU processing power. You're not going to put that thing on a regular laptop if you want to have any more than about three or four routers on it. So if you're going to use packet.net or you can use their servers, that's pretty cheap. Um, but like I said, you can get their servers for like 40 cents an hour, um, which come preloaded with viral. You know, you import your own license into that, which is super easy. So, you know, with, with viral, you can definitely do pretty much anything from CCNA all the way up to CCIE routing and switching for that $200 initial cost plus the, your, your hourly cost. Now, if you compare that to our racks, okay, um, you asked specifically about layer two stuff. So I'm gonna just focus on that. With three switches, like you see here in our CCNA, CCMP racks, you could do pretty much anything you wanted to uh, for, for switching. Now, the, these are real physical switches. Those, they support everything. And with our racks, um, these cost three tokens per hour. So the list price of a token is $1. So that's $3 an hour to access this. Now, you can't just purchase three tokens. I think the minimum quantity of tokens you can purchase is 100 tokens. Uh, so at list price, you're looking at $100. So there's the contrast right there. So $200 up front for viral plus your hourly fee for the servers or $100 up front for 100 tokens, which will get you roughly 33 hours of practice on these racks. And trust me, INE is having sales all the time on tokens. Um, so they're not always at list price. A lot of times they're at a discounted rate. As a matter of fact, before I forget, I know we have a sale going on right now, and let me just see here. Okay, so in the event that you haven't seen this, I just want to make sure you guys are aware of this. 
right now in the month of April, uh, we have a 25% off sale for all of our boot camps. So if you decide you want to take one of our CCNA, our CCNP, or our CCIE boot camps, now is the time to buy those because you get 25% off of those. Uh, so you might want to look into that. So hopefully that answered your question there about how to prepare for layer two. Uh, let's see here. What other questions do you have? Uh, Jay, you ask a good question. I, I don't have an answer for you. Uh, you say, is, is software-defined networking or SD-WAN taking the place of MPLS any time in the next few years? Um, from the perspective of, if I'm interpreting your question correctly, since we're talking about certification exams, I would interpret your question as, in the next few years, can we expect MPLS topics and labs to be removed from the exams and in their place SD-WAN inserted. I haven't heard anything about that. I haven't heard of that type of uh, switch taking place. Um, so I would expect MPLS to still be a significant portion of the exams, especially the service provider exams for, for quite a while. Twin Cities 612, you ask a good question here. You say, what do you recommend for your CCNA video course? GNS3, packet tracer, or a home lab. Uh, so for my CCNA video course, I actually have several of them and I'm trying to think which one you might be referring to. Um, if you go to, I'm, I'm thinking that what you're probably referring to is the video course where I basically have you do labs on your own. Where I say, here's an objective, make this lab work. And then the next video I say, and here's how you do it, let me show you. Um, so if that is correct, if that's what you're referring to, that would be, which one is that? Um, mm, 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 mm. It's not the technologies videos, routing and switching practice exam. It's not that. Oh, it's this one right here. I think you're talking about the, the CCNA let me bring this up here so I can show this to you. I believe you're talking about this one right here. Let me put this in here. The CCNA routing and switching V3 exam review course. And uh, I didn't have the screen up, so let me just show you how I got to this once again. So I just went to, from, uh, from the members dashboard, I just went to All Access Pass. I went to Cisco. CCNA routing and switching, and it's down there towards the bottom. The CCNA routing and switching exam th exam review. And what this is, is this is a bunch of videos where I will go through a video and, for example, let's just choose, uh, how about the spanning tree video right here, spanning tree part one. So in the beginning of the video, I will outline an objective. I will say, you know, make this happen. Let's go ahead and put this up here. So I'll give you a topology, and all of these topologies, all of these labs are built on using our rack rentals. So this is assuming you're using INE's CCNA and CCNP rack rentals to create these. And so once you've got the topology here, I'll, I'll, I'll say uh, physical layer topology, yeah, yeah, yeah. What is this? Well, if you're going to follow along in this video series here, this is, here we go. This is what I was looking for. So it'll start out like this. The video series will start out with, here's your objectives. And the idea is you, you pause this, take a screen grab of it, and then try to make that work. And then once you've got it working or once you get stuck, you resume the video and you watch me go through it. And you watch me actually do it. So like I said, all of these are based on using our racks. Um, if you were gonna do this and you were not gonna do our racks, um, let's see, this is CCNA. You could do probably 85 or 90% of what you see in these videos here using Packet Tracer. 
Packet Tracer would allow you to do the vast majority of what you see here. Um, GNS3, not so much. Uh, Cisco Viral, you could do all of this in Cisco Viral. So those are your options. If you want to do all of it, it's either renting time on hour racks or using Cisco Viral, or you could use Packet Tracer and try to get your topology to look as closely as possible to the topology I've created in here, and then you could do most of it. Generally speaking, uh, when, I'm, when I'm telling people who are starting out their pursuit of their CCNA, I usually tell people for, who are pursuing their CCNA to just download and use Packet Tracer, uh, to build your own labs, to play around with stuff. There's no gr greater tool than Packet Tracer just to get used to the Cisco iOS command line. And Packet Tracer's got, like I said, 85 or 90% of all the commands in it that you would ever need to know to pass your CCNA exam. All right, so what other questions do we have here? Uh, Atuos, you say you're planning on taking your CCNT exam in July. Great. How do you suggest I study and be fully prepared? Well, I don't know where you are right now. Um, I don't know if you're just beginning or if you're sort of along the continuum as far as your studying is concerned. The recommended advice I give people is always the same. I say try to dedicate at least two hours a day, Monday through Friday, consistently for studying, and then a minimum of three or four hours a day on Saturday and Sunday for your studying. And if you can do that day after day, week after week, and you can um, be consistent about it, you should be prepared to take your CCNT or your ICND2 uh, within roughly three to four months. I would say you should be ready for that. Now, during that study time, you're going to want to mix it up with several things. Part of that study time is certainly going to be reading, uh, like reading online documents, reading the Cisco Press books. Part of that time is going to be watching videos and using other multimedia to, you know, sort of absorb the knowledge. Part of that time is going to be creating flashcards and testing yourself on those flashcards. I'm a big proponent of using flashcards. And part of that time is going to be doing lab work. Uh, since we're talking about the CCENT, that would most likely involve using Packet Tracer and just practicing the commands and getting familiar with them and, and memorizing them. So that's how I would suggest that you proceed between now and July to get ready for it. Okay, and uh, Illich, you're asking uh, what's happening in the EIGRP with the same router ID? the rest of the database, or external routes? Uh, so this is more of definitely more of a, of a technical question about how EIGRP works, so I'll just speak to this very, very briefly. So a lot of routing protocols, right? And for those of you guys who are just starting out on your studies, a routing protocol is when two routers are speaking to each other a certain language, and they're saying, hey, let me tell you about the routes that I know. You know, you can get to these particular networks over here through me. So routing protocol is a language that routers speak to inform each other about routes, about network reachability. Well, a lot of routing protocols, when they start up, the router will give itself a unique name called a router identifier. And that router identifier may or may not be inside the routing messages. So when router one is sending a routing protocol message to router two, that name, that router ID might be inside that message, it might not. Now, in the case of EIGRP, when EIGRP sends routes, it can send either what's called internal or external routes. When EIGRP is sending a routing update containing internal routes, there is no mention of a router ID in there. So, so literally, um, now if you and I are directly connected, if you and I are neighbors and we have the same router ID, that would be a problem because we will not become neighbors. The, the, as in the process of forming an EIGRP neighbor relationship, we will learn what each other's router ID is, and if it's the same, that's a problem. But let's say that there's a router behind me, so you're neighbors with me, and I'm neighbors with him, and he has the same router ID as you. Now, that shouldn't happen, but it could. Now, in that event, if he sends me an EIGRP update, if it contains internal routes, I will pass those along to you. And in that EIGRP update, there is no mention of his name. There is no mention of his router ID. So the fact that he's got the same router ID as you will not hurt anything. 
Now, when we're talking about EIGRP external routes, that's when having a duplicate router ID will be a problem. Because when I send you an EIGRP routing update that has external routes inside of it, I do include my name, my router ID. So that way, whether you're connected to me or you're five or six routers away from me, if you get my routes and you see this got my name in it and it's the same as yours, you will discard that. You will not even trust those, you will not believe it, and that will lead to all sorts of problems with routing. So that's sort of my, my long answer to that question. Uh, another question, will there be a new CCNP routing and switching in this year? I wish I knew. I wish I knew the answer to that question. Um, you know, Cisco keeps the timeline of when they're going to come out with updates very closely guarded secret. Uh, even as an internal Cisco employee, which I was for 17 years, you don't know that stuff unless you're actually working in the department that is creating and editing and managing the tests. If you're not in that department, even you don't know when they're going to come out with a new exam. I will tell you this. The last time the CCNP exams, the route, the switch, and the T-shoot were updated was back in 2015. I believe it was in January of 2015. And typically speaking, Cisco updates and revises their exams usually every three to four years. So we are scheduled, we are due for an update. You know, we are now a little more than three years into it. Um, it would not surprise me if Cisco made an advertisement sometime this year that they were going to update their CCNP exams. But if you're familiar with that process, it should not cause you worry. It should not cause you anxiety because the way Cisco does it is very nice. Uh, what will happen is, let's say that, that right now you're studying for, uh, let's just pick an exam, the, the Cisco uh, T-shoot exam, the CCNP T-shoot exam. So you've been studying for that for like a month. And you figure, okay, well, I'll probably be ready to take this in about another two months. I'll be ready. And all of a sudden, bam, you get that email from Cisco that says, hey, we've come up with a new uh, CCNP refresh. New exams are out. This is what they'll do. They'll say, from this date right now when we're announcing it until six months from now, it's usually a six-month window, you have the next six months from the time of the announcement to continue taking the old exams, or if you want to, you can take the new exam. It's your choice. Now, once that six month period is up, then the old exams officially become retired. You can no longer take them, and now you have to take the new exam. So whenever they do make an announcement for a new CCNA or a new CCNP, it's not like all of your studying will be in vain. You'll still have that six month window in which to take the old test, and you won't be forced to take the new one. Uh, now, will that happen this year? Honestly, I don't know, and nobody I know knows the answer to that question. Could be this year. If it's not this year, I would definitely expect it to be next year. All right, what other questions do we have? Uh, Salim, you ask a question here. Is it enough if I go through the videos of previous Cisco, Cisco exams and Cisco Press book of the current exam? All right, let me re re read your question here. And Cisco Pressbooks. Um, short answer is no. And here's why. All of these exams require that you know the Cisco IOS command line at a minimum, right? That you know how to work with routers and switches. And certainly on some of the other exams like security and stuff, you know, you have to know various GUIs like Cisco ACS server and the ICE application and uh, all sorts of other stuff. You can't really get that knowledge, you can't really memorize that just from watching videos and reading books. You got to get some hands-on time working with the routers and the switches to get comfortable with the command line so you can memorize it, so you can know what the commands are. So any study plan should involve those, should involve really five components, whether you're studying for the CCNA, the CCNP, or the CCIE, Five components should be essential in every study plan. Reading, which would be like the Cisco Press books at a minimum. Watching videos, which will supplement the Cisco Press books. Um, making flashcards, lots of flashcards. Doing lots of practice exams over and over and over again. And doing labs, doing lab work. Those are the five things you really need to incorporate into your studying attempts for any exam.
And uh, BV, yeah, you make a very good comment. Uh, maybe when they uh, update or refresh their CCNP exams, they'll retire frame relay. Myself and lots of other people believe that too. Uh, there's, a, there's a common belief that frame relay will go away whenever Cisco gets around to refreshing their, their route exam for CCNP. And they will most likely replace it with DMVPN. That's probably what they'll replace it with. So if you want to get a heads up, you might want to start studying DMVPN, start practicing configuring it, start, especially start working with OSPF over DMVPN, because I would, I would be willing to bet money that when Cisco route is refreshed, frame relay will go away, DMVPN will take its place, and they will expect you to know how to configure OSPF over DMVPN. Alex, you ask a good question here. If the CCMP gets refreshed this year, will any of the exams count as credit for an updated CCNP if one didn't complete the CCNP in time for the refresh? Yes. Um, the way, and I, I have not been able to find this on their website. So as I mentioned this, if any of you guys know how to find this on the website, I'd like to be like to have a link for it. But what I recall is that when you pass one of the CCNP exams, like for example, let's say that today you were to pass the existing CCNP switch exam. Okay, so you got your, you passed that today. Cisco gives you a year to pass your next exam. And that's the part I can't find on their website anywhere, but I, I'm almost certain of that. Um, and I will look that up if you guys know where that is. So you have a year to pass your next exam. So let's say you pass CCMP switch today. Well, it's not gonna take you a year to get ready to pass route, okay? It, it shouldn't. Uh, it might take you six months, maybe. Now let's say that you pass switch and tomorrow there's an announcement from Cisco that they're updating the CCNPs. They've got a whole new route, switch, and T-shoot exams. And, you, and they say, okay, within the next six months, you can take the old or the new, but after six months, you have to take the new. And you think to yourself, okay, well, I just passed switch, but I don't think I can pass route and T-shoot within that six-month window. You don't have to worry about it. You've got that credit for switch. As long as you pass one of the other tests within the next year, route or T-shoot, that credit you earn for passing the switch today will still be applicable. Okay, so you don't, you don't have to worry about that. It is still good. And uh, let's see here. What other questions do we have? Let me scroll up here. Arsalan, I see your question there about what is the reliable transport protocol. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause that for a second because that's more of a, of a technical question. I just wanna scroll down and see if there's any more questions related to actual like the certification exams themselves. Uh, Salim asks, how much effort in time should I give for the CCNP? Well, if you do that same studying schedule that I talked about, two hours a day, Monday through Friday, minimum, and three or four hours a day on Saturdays and Sundays consistently, I would say that you should be able to knock out the switch exam in three to four months for the switch exam. Route exam is a lot longer. So let's say it takes you four, four months for the switch. It'd probably take you um, five to six months for route. So let's say that's 10 months total. And then once you've got switch and route done, it shouldn't take you very long to do T-shoot. T-shoot does not require you to learn any new technologies. There's nothing new to memorize for T-shoot. Um, so literally after you pass switch and route, I would say you'd be ready to pass to go for T-shoot within a month. Um, so I think a year is a realistic time frame to get all three tests done for the CCNP exam.
Silas asked the question, are routers running two instances of EIGRP? Uh, both autonomous systems are advertising the same networks. Which AS will the router use by default? Uh, the router won't care. Uh, if, if, if I'm a router and I learn of network 50 via this neighbor who's an autonomous system 100, and I learn of network 50 via EIGRP autonomous system 200 from this neighbor, if both of those networks are the same type of network, in other words, if they're both EIGRP internal or they're both EIGRP external, then I will simply uh, compare their distance values. And if their distance values are the same, I'll put them both into my routing table and I'll just do load balancing between them. So Nicholas, I think I just answered uh, the question about preparing for the CCNP. Someone says, should I learn Python alongside my CCNA? Because there seems to be a lot of talk about network automation being the future. Uh, there is. There is a lot of talk about that. That's really a very subjective question. Uh, Python is definitely very valuable to learn. Yeah, I hear people talking about it all the time. Uh, it seems to be a very valuable skill set to have. And certainly if you're seeking a job as a network engineer, being able to write scripts to automate things with Python in medium to large networks will be a very useful skill set in addition to having a Cisco certification. So short answer, yes. If you've got the bandwidth, you've got, if you've got the, the mental uh, ability to learn Python as well as your Cisco certification, it certainly will not hurt you. Absolutely. Uh, Ismail asks, the CCNA routing and switching or the CCNA security? Or the CCNP routing and switching? Which, which path is more beneficial? Well, I'll tell you this. You cannot take the CCNA security unless you have an active CCNA routing and switching. You can't just start with CCNA security. You have to have already have a CCNA routing and switching that's active, that has not expired, in order to do CCNA security. Same thing is true with CCNP. In order to uh, do the CCNP, you have to have an active C. So you pretty much have to start with your CCNA routing and switching. Have to get that done. Now, once you've got your CCNA routing and switching, I typically recommend to people, hey, look, you know, you've been studying and routing and switching, routing and switching for months. That's been burned into your brain. While that's still in there, while you're st while you still memorize all those routing and switching concepts, it makes sense to just add on to what you already know by pursuing the CCNP routing and switching. And then, once you've got your CCNP routing and switching, then you can branch off to some specialty, like the CCNA security or the CCNA wireless or something like that. Here's the risk that you run. If you got the CCNA routing and switching right now, and then you immediately start pursuing the CCNA security, or the CCNA data center, or something like that. And, okay, so you're looking at now another four months, roughly, of study to get your second CCNA. Once that four months is over, that's four months that you've been sort of out of the world of routing and switching, that you haven't been touching routing and switching. Now, if you want to get back into routing and switching so you can get your CCNP, it's going to be a lot harder for you. Uh-oh, I just got a message here, the video is unavailable. What happened there? Can you guys still hear me? Because on my side, it says the video is unavailable. And I'm just wondering if that's just me or if that's uh, everybody. Okay. Okay, uh, let me just refresh my browser here. Okay, weird. Okay, I guess it was just on my side. Okay, so if you were seeing that, just refresh your browser and the video should come back. Not sure what happened. All right, sorry. Uh, so short answer is get your CCNA routing and switching, CCNP routing and switching, and then branch off to a specialty if you wish.
Uh, let me scroll up through here and see what other questions you guys have. Lots of good questions today. You guys are awesome. Keeping me on my toes. Okay. Um, let's see here. Um, Alexandra says, just purchased the CCNA bundle, which includes many courses. You're right, it does. Which to start first? What is the best path? Okay, um, if you are, let's see here. I wonder if I have one moment. I might be able to, because working on a project just last week for somebody here at i &E who was asking me to sort of rank and order the various videos that people should watch for CCNA. And I think I still have that document, which I can display to you guys. Okay, let me just put this over here. And I'll make this a little bit larger for you. This is gonna make it on our website. It might already be there, I have not checked. Um, but for the CCNA, I would recommend, let me just zoom in on this a little bit. Okay, uh, so I would start out with this video, Introduction to Networking Technologies. That's sort of like the real baseline ground level video. Um, and then, Watch the CCNA routing and switching overview and preparation and the kickoff session. So that'll get you familiar with uh, how to prepare for the test, what to expect when you sit down for the test, what type of questions you're going to see. And then you're going to start preparing for your ICND-1 exam. Uh, for, so for ICND-1, I'd recommend starting with the what is Ethernet and why should I care? And then you're going to watch the ICND-1 Technologies video series. And while you're watching that, there are other videos you're going to want to sort of insert in the middle of that. For example, there's uh, the deciphering and working with network topology diagrams. There's the routing and switching IPv4 addressing and subnetting. IP routing basics. So let me just keep this right here. Hold on a second. Let me put this in, in a way that you can... Uh, maybe make a screenshot of this. Okay, so why don't you go ahead and take a, a screenshot of this. I'll give you five seconds to do that. Okay, and then after that, take a screenshot of this. And by the way, this is being recorded today. Uh, so if you're not able to take these screenshots, the recording should be up within a week or so. And then after that, you would watch the common network applications, basic network troubleshooting. And then you're also going to want to work through the ICD-1 lab workbook while you're doing that. And here are some videos on how to do labs as far as like creating your own labs, tools available for you. And here we also have the practice exams and then hopefully at the very bottom here I would see you in one of my CCNA boot camps coming up. Love to have you guys join me for that. So that's the, for, for ICND-1, that is the, the, the approach I would take. All right, so what other questions do we have here?
Okay, here's a good question from Mega. How does the CCMP route exam divide the questions in terms of simulations, simlets, and multiple choice? So the, the route exam still has a lot of multiple choice, so all those exams are still heavily leaning towards the multiple choice questions. Um, I will tell you this, uh, I was surprised in the CCMP route exam how many drag and drops there were. Uh, like in the CCNA exam, I've seen like just one or two drag and drops. I had like five drag and drop questions in the CCNP exam, so that was the route exam specifically. Um, simulations, there weren't a lot of simulations. I think I had three simulations and maybe another two or three of the testlets and simlets. Uh, so that's sort of how they broke that down. And by the way, learn IPv6. Don't neglect IPv6, especially in the route exam. IPv6 is very heavy in the route exam. Make sure you know how to configure OSPF, EIGRP, and RIP for IPv6. Become proficient on that. I was very surprised at the quantity of IPv6 related questions in the CCMP route exam. And Arslan, you, you mentioned you've got a, a lab consisting of seven routers and four switches. What topology would you use? I would just recommend just going back to the topology I showed you earlier, uh, the one that we've built here for our racks. Where is that? Right here. Just try to make your topology sort of match that. Okay, I will, I will reduce this. Actually, you probably want to see it. There you go. Now you can see both of them at the same time. So if you're building a topology of your own, I would say try to replicate that as closely as possible. And Poria, you're asking, would you mind please telling us what are the BGP problems right now? I can't tell you specifically what I saw regarding BGP on the exam. I mean, that would be breaking a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, Cisco could yank my certification numbers from me if I did that. Um, but I will tell you BGP is not a huge part of the exam. Um, I would recommend that you spend a lot more of your time studying OSPF and EIGRP, and not as much time studying BGP. That's pretty much all I can say about that. And Anuragax, you say your CCNA is expiring in July. If you give the CCMP switch route, would it update your CCNA? Um, Yes. Now, what I'm wondering, what I'm not sure of is, let's find out here. What I'm not sure of is, I know, for example, you know, if, if I take the CCIE written exam and I pass that, that automatically refreshes my lower level exams. What I'm not sure about is, you know, the CCNP is technically three exams. And I don't know, I'll find this out here in like 30 seconds, if I just pass one of those exams, like if I just pass the switch exam, even though I don't have my CCNP yet, because I haven't done all three, by passing that one exam, did that automatically refresh my lower level CCNA exam? So let's just do this. CCNA um, recertification. Recertification, let's go in here. Okay. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. How to recertify. How to recertify. All right, certification. So, yeah, the CCNA, CCNPs, those are good for three years. Okay, recertification table, routing and switching, blah, 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 blah. I will find out. 
Um, I will find out the answer to that question. Okay, here we go. Val to recertify, pass one of the following before the certification exam. Pass any current associate, pass any 642. Oh, here you go. Pass any 300-XXX professional level exam. So yeah, all you have to do is pass one of the CCNP exams. You pick route or switch. If you pass that one before July, it will automatically recertify your CCNA. So there we go. Uh, Rosalan asked a good question. So you're going through the CCMP route, very difficult test. Any advice on how to tackle the CCMP route properly? I'm reading route official certification guide and the foundation learning guides and planning on labs using GNS3. Well, definitely you're going along the right approach. Uh, reading those books and, and doing labs and stuff on GNS3 is, is very important. Let me show you something which will help you prepare for route. Actually, I think I've already got up here. So here in route, when we look in the blueprint, I'll give you a little hint. Now, yes, in the blueprint, I'll make this a little bit bigger. You can see that 40% of the questions come from layer three technologies. So that could lead you to believe, oh, well, I'm going to spend the majority of my study time learning about OSPF, EIGRP, RIP, and BGP, and that should be good. Well, you would fail. I definitely would recommend that, let's open up the details here on infrastructure security. Absolutely would spend a significant time on bullet point 5.4 and on infrastructure services, this one right here. So even though they only give this one a weight of 20%, don't neglect it. Um, really get familiar with this stuff. Um, create a lot of flashcards on these things. Some of these things are kind of hard to do in the lab. For example, configuring SNMP. Well, yeah, you can configure SNMP on a router switch, but where do you get the server to, or the SNMP manager to actually pull that router and switch to see if you configure the router switch correctly? That part is kind of tough. Um, but yeah, uh, same thing with NetFlow here, right? In order to configure and verify NetFlow, you'd actually have to have a NetFlow collector to collect the statistics and see if you did it correctly. But I would definitely recommend that in addition to practicing routing, you spend a good amount of time on infrastructure security and infrastructure services. You will be surprised at how many questions in those two categories you will see. Let me go through some of your additional questions here. All right, so Twin Cities 612, you ask a good question. With being a novice and only having an A plus certification, is it possible with doubling the amount of time that I recommended for studying for the CCENT to pass it in two months instead of three to four months? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, a lot of that also is dependent on how easily you can memorize things. Uh, because really, I mean, that's what these exams are all about, right? It's, it's memorization, memorization then, then regurgitating what you memorized. So if you are able to double the amount of time and if you can do well at creating those flashcards, quizzing yourself and memorizing the topics, absolutely, I think you could pass a CCENT in two months. A lot of people are asking, do you need to study Python? You don't need to study Python. Um, it's helpful. In today's world, it will certainly help you get a job and put you a little bit above other job seekers, but do you have to study Python? No, um, but it, it, if you can, it's advisable to do that. Three D zero says for me, the C was mostly multiple choice. 
is a CCNA exam the same with a few SIMLEC questions? Yeah, yeah. So the, when you say CCNA, I'm assuming you're talking about the ICND-2 exam. Uh, the ICND-2 exam, yes. So of the 50 or 55 questions you get in there, a good 80 or 85 percent of those will be multiple choice. Um, you can expect to see anywhere from one to three router simulations and maybe a couple of the testlets or simlets, but by far the majority of the questions will be multiple choice. Oh, Gareth. <laughs> ah, ask me to reveal myself here. Hi, Keith. How many attempts did you have with the CCIE? I'm curious. I've read a lot of stories online about five to six attempts. Well, I certainly didn't do it in one attempt. Um, I believe it took me three attempts at the written and I passed the lab in my second attempt. But my story is kind of unique because when I was going for my CCIE, I actually worked at Cisco. I worked in the Technical Assistance Center. So my dedicated job was doing routing and switching and I had a lab there that I could use. And so I had a lot of resources available to me that most people don't. And, and most of you guys watching, you know, when you're studying for your test, you're going to be doing it on your off hours, not as part of your day job, right? During lunch or something like that. I was fortunate in that my day job was preparing me for my CCIE. So yeah, a lot of people could take five or six attempts to do it. I, th I think most people usually pass it in like three or maybe four attempts. I'm talking about the lab here uh, for their, their CCIE. Uh, Salim, you're asking, is there any value in the market of holding a CCNA uh, and a CCNP? A lot of people have a CCNA. So if you are applying for a position and all you have on your resume is a CCNA, that's going to be kind of tough. It's going to be kind of tough for you to get a job with just that. A CCNP will push you a, a bit further. Not as many people have their CCNPs. Uh, so if you've got a CCNA and a CCNP, that will get you a lot more likelihood to get you in the door for those job interviews than just a CCNA would. All right. Well, I've almost made it to the bottom. Oh, I thought I made it to the bottom, then all of a sudden, boop, a whole bunch of new questions. Okay, let's see here. Um, which version of Cisco operating system do I need? So for your routers, you would definitely want to have 15 dot something like 15 dot three or 15 dot four. So once again, this is just for the routing and switching, right? If we we're talking about service provider or collaboration or something, we'd have to talk about like the XE and the XR versions and all that stuff. For, for just the CCNA and CCNP routing and switching, you can just stick with the like 15.3, 15.4 Cisco iOS on your routers. Um, and then whatever the latest version is on the switches is, is sufficient. Once again, a lot of people are asking about setting up a lab for CCNP. And I'll just refer you back to uh, too many windows. What happened to it? The diagram that I had for our lab. I'll go ahead and put this, I'll keep this up here while I'm looking through your remaining questions. There you go. Uh, let's see what else here. Um, high pitch. Good question. What is the T-shoot question breakdown? One imagines more SIMs than the other two exams. Yeah, so the T-shoot is 95% simulations, 5% other stuff. 
So in the T-shoot exam, you will get maybe five or six multiple choice questions, maybe three or four drag and drops, but the vast majority of that exam is actually a simulation. And in the T-shoot exam, you are doing what's called tickets. Uh, so, and, so let me show you something here. So we have a workbook that we created to help people prepare for the T-shoot. The CCMP T-shoot workbook. Here's the introduction to it. Okay, so the, the, when you're taking the tickets within the CCNP T-shoot exam, each ticket is based off the exact same topology. And you should be able to Google for CCNP T-shoot exam topology and find it. It is publicly accessible. I, don't want to spend time right now looking for it, but the topology looks almost identical to this, almost identical. So the T-shoot exam, I think, has like six routers and four switches and a client. So in the T-shoot exam, this right here would be like a PC, and then you'd have four routers here, and then you'd have, I think, like one or two other stuff out here. So because our topology has four routers and three switches, I tried to make our topology as closely resemble the actual CCNP T-shoot topology as possible. So what you see here, so if you do our workbook and you download the pre-configurations as you're working through tickets, it will create this topology. And this is almost identical to what you'll see. The subnets are the same, 10110, 10140, 1011, that's the same. The area numbers are the same. The fact that this area right here is a not so stubby area, you'll see that in the exact same place on the T-sheet exam. The fact that you've got OSPF domain number one, EIGRP autonomous system 10, that is the same. Um, as you scroll down here, the IPv6 layout and the IPv6 prefixes, those are the same. So, and the VLANs are the same. So my intent behind this workbook was that by the time you go through all the tickets, you would basically have this topology diagram memorized, which will be very helpful for you going into the T-shoot exam. Because when you sit down at the T-shoot exam, you don't want to be shuffling back and forth between windows, looking at the topology diagram, then going back in the simulation. Looking at the topology diagram, then going back in the simulation. You will totally waste time doing that. I always advise people, hey, find the actual T-shoot topology, the real one, which looks almost identical to this, and memorize it. Memorize, you should be able to get to the point where you can actually draw this topology diagram on a piece of paper from your mind before you go in and take the T-shoot exam. Let me give you an example. I teach classes on this stuff all the time, right? I love routing and switching. I love developing labs. I love this stuff. When I sat down for the T-shoot exam, because I wanted to see what was on it, what it was laid out like, I had not memorized the topology diagram. I had not done what I'm advising you guys, okay? And unfortunately, the way the window, the screen is laid out when you're taking this CCMP T-shoot exam, the screen real estate is not large enough for you to have the topology diagram fully visible in one side and have the actual, you know, telnet windows and stuff and visible in the other. You can't do that. So you have to basically close down your telnet windows and go back to the topology diagram to reference it. And I found myself doing that tons of times because I didn't know where the subnets were. I didn't know where router one was in relationship to router two. I didn't know any of that stuff. And because I kept flipping back and forth between the diagram and then bring up the telnet window, the diagram and the telnet window. By the time I, I finished my last ticket, I literally had about 15 seconds left on the clock. Talk about cutting it close. That's why I tell people, hey, memorize the diagram and save yourself that hassle when you go in and you take it. So yeah, long story short is, when you take the T-shoot exam, you're gonna have a bunch of tickets and the tickets will look very similar to this. For example, I'll just take a look at ticket number one right here. You have the diagram, 
And it's always the exact same thing. Every ticket is the same. You've got some sort of client and the problem is the client cannot ping the server. That's what you're troubleshooting. But there's a million different reasons why that might not be pingable. Could be routing, could be switching, could be an access list, could be all sorts of stuff. So in the ticket, that's your problem. And then you have to identify three things. So the ticket has three multiple choice questions within the ticket. The first question is, on which device did you find the problem? So as part of your troubleshooting, you will narrow down, okay, you, you've logged into router three, for example. You'll be able to log into all of this stuff in the simulations. You'll say, oh, I believe the problem is on router three. I think that's where it is. So you, you select that on the multiple choice question. Then the next multiple choice question that will open up within that same ticket will be, the problem was related to which technology? And it might say, Layer 2 VLANs, trunking, IGP routing, access lists, security. And so if you've found the problem, you will select one of those. Oh, the problem was definitely related to IGP routing. Select that. And then the third multiple choice question within that same ticket will show you a list of commands. And it'll say, which command would you type in to fix the problem? And then you'll identify the command. So as you're going through the ticket, you're not actually solving the problem. You're identifying where it is, you're identifying what it is, and you're identifying what command you would use to fix it. So these tickets here, if you use our workbook, and I, I think this is, this is the most fun workbook I created when I was doing this. So when you log into our racks, if you want to do this workbook, you would log into our rack, and then in our racks, there's a, there's a drop-down menu where you can select a pre-configuration. So you would select like pre-configuration T-shoot ticket number one. And that would load this ticket that would, that would pre-configure the topology with all these IP addresses, these OSPF areas, and it would pre-configure it with a problem. And then in ticket number one, you have to identify which device was the problem on. You select one here. And then you have to identify uh, the problem was related to which technology. You would select one. And then in my tickets, I actually have you fix it. So the third thing is, what command or action was necessary to fix the problem? And then you fix the problem, you expand this, and you can see, here's the command, and, and here's what you would have seen as a result of fixing the problem. So that's, that's how I would recommend you prepare for the T-shoot. Mostly tickets, very few multiple choice. All right, what other questions do we have here? Uh, Mohammed asked a good question. Which book should I follow? Todd Lamel's or Wendell Odom's for the CCNA? I would, I would lean towards Wendell Odom's books only because his books are in the Cisco Press. Cisco Press published his books. Todd Lamel is not Cisco Press. Now, Todd Lamel is an excellent author. A lot of people love his writing style. A lot of people love what he writes. I tend to lean towards the Cisco Press books only because I know those books had to be edited and um, reviewed by Cisco before they actually came out. So they basically have Cisco's blessing. So I, I feel a lot more comfortable knowing that when I'm studying for a certification exam, whatever is in a Cisco Press book has been blessed and authorized by Cisco. If I'm reading a book that's not Cisco Press, I don't really have any assurances that what's in that book is of the correct depth, of the correct technical level. I don't really have any assurances that they may not have left stuff out. Uh, that's why I prefer, uh, at the CCNA level, Wendell Odom's books for that reason. And somebody asked, hey, are these tickets part of the rack rental? So you would pair this up. So basically you would purchase the CCNP T-Shoot workbook. Uh, if you have an all access pass, this might come with your all access pass. I'm not sure about that. I think an all access pass gives you access to all the workbooks as well, but you want to check on that. Anyway, you want access to the T-Shoot workbook and then you would want to rent time on our racks. Let's go back to this. 
And then once you get to the rack, once you get to your rack, the CCNP rack, right here in the left corner where it says select configuration, you would just type T-shoot. And so, you know, if you're working on ticket one, you would select this, T-shoot, um, not T-shoot switch ticket one. These are the, these are for if you attend my boot camp, my CCNP routing and switching boot camp. So these are specific just to what we do inside the boot camp. If you're working on the workbook, that's all these right here. So T-shoot ticket one is for the first ticket in the workbook. You would click on load config. And after about five or six minutes after the script in the background is done working, it would preload all the routers and switches so you could work on that ticket. You could log into them and try to decode what the problem is. Okay, so let's see here. Got about 15 minutes left to go, so let me keep going through your questions here. Arsalan asks, which track is better, the CCIE routing and switching or the CCIE data center? Um, data center is very hot in demand these days. So honestly, you'd probably get a job faster and you'd probably get a higher paying job with a CCIE data center than you would with a CCIE routing and switching. So short answer to that question. And Salim is asking how, um, for the CCNP, I think what you're asking is how long is each test, how long is each test how long are you given and how many questions do you have? So you get the same duration of time. So if I scroll on here, you can see, so this is route, you've got two hours. So for switch and route, you get two hours, 45 to 65 questions. And I think T-shoot is the same. Now T-shoot, you don't have as many questions. T-shoot. Yeah, so T-shoot, you also get two hours, but it's only 15 to 25 questions. But don't let that fool you. Remember, of those, let's say you get 20 questions. Of those 20 questions, 14 or 15 of them are going to be those troubleshooting tickets. And each ticket could easily take you 10 minutes or more to go through, depending on your proficiency with, with troubleshooting. Okay, uh, let's see, what else do you have? And uh, interdeep, as far as how to study troubleshooting, really it's just, you have to practice. Um, there's a couple ways to practice troubleshooting. Uh, certainly, you know, we have our CCNP T-shoot workbook where you can download pre-configs that already have problems in them. What are other things you can do? Um, I know with Packet Tracer, uh, when you are using Packet Tracer, it creates a file called a PKT file. That's what Packet Tracer creates. And I'm sure there are, I haven't looked for this, but I'm sure there are websites out there where people have created PKT files with topologies with problems broken in them. And if you download the PKT file and, and install it in your version of Packet Tracer, you can troubleshoot their problems. That's another way you can do it. Another thing you can do, you know, when I'm creating labs, for example, when I was, when I'm first learning about, um, for example, OSPF, and OSPF says, okay, well, in order for these two routers to talk to each other, uh, certain things have to match, certain things have to line up. Well, as I'm doing my labs, I'll be thinking to myself, okay, well, certainly I want to do a lab and make those things line up, but I want to see what it looks like when things break. And I might think to myself, okay, well, according to uh, the OSPF guidelines, these two routers have to be in the same subnet with the same subnet mask. 
So I will actually intentionally misconfigure them with incorrect subnet masks because I want to see, you know, am I going to see a syslog? What's the debug going to look like? So I would recommend that as you're doing labs, intentionally break things so you can get familiar with what that looks like when things are broken and how you fix it. All right, let's see what else. Um, Alex, you asked a good question. Is there any scripting recommended for loading configs for labs on live equipment? Is, uh, is Tickle good enough? I know we use Python. Uh, I don't know Python. I don't know how to do Python, but I know that we have a, a guy in our company who wrote Python scripts. So when you're using our racks and you're downloading a pre-config, that's, ha that's, that's, that's what's happening. Python is grabbing that config and Python is going into each device and loading it. Um, so I know Python can work well to do that. Uh, Tickle can probably also work to do that as well. Um, Arsalan asks a technical question. What is unequal cost load balancing? Um, I can speak to that briefly. So unequal cost load balancing basically looks like this. Here you have a router, say router one, router two, router three, and here's network X over here. Okay. So normally when router three advertises network X to router one and router two advertises network X to router one, you can see the router one will normally say, oh, well the path going down here, going down through router three is obviously better. It's just shorter to get to network X that way. So normally in router one, he would install the path this way to get to network X because that's the better path. Unequal cost load balancing is where you do something, you do some sort of command or something in router one to get him to install the top path in his routing table as well. So when you go in the routing table and you look for route to network X, you actually see both the route going to router three and the route going to router two, they're both in the routing table which means that now when packets come in to router one and they're going to network X, he can send some of those packets up to router two and he can send some of those packets down to router three, even though the path to router two is not as good. That is what's meant by unequal cost load balancing. Uh, let's see here. Another couple questions. We've got time for another three or four questions. Uh, source file asked the question, Mr. Bogar, what do you think about using INI videos and Cisco's viral for studying for recertification for CCNP and beyond? I think it's great. Uh, like I said earlier, Cisco viral, I'm very impressed with how they've made it a lot more streamlined to install it. Certainly if you're using packet.net instead of installing it on your own local machine, super easy to get that working. So yeah, for the CCNP and above, uh, viral is a, is a great option for doing lab work and studying. BGP nonstop forwarding, um, I'm not, I'm not familiar with BGP nonstop forwarding, but I can tell you this, uh, I know how nonstop forwarding typically works in, in other types of protocols. And I suspect it would work the same way in, in BGP. 
is something along these lines. Let's say that you had a switch right here and you had a router one and you had router two. Normally speaking, if, and let's say these two guys here are doing some sort of routing protocol like EIGRP as an example. Normally speaking, if, if router one lost its neighbor relationship to router two, like for example, router two crashed or something like that, router one would delete all the routes that it learned from router two. And then when router two came back up again, a whole new neighbor relationship would have to be formed and they'd have to exchange the routes back and forth to each other. The concept of nonstop forwarding, typically what that means is that you might lose your neighbor for a moment, maybe your neighbor crashes or something, but you and your neighbor have this agreement that if he goes down, you will keep his routes in your routing table and you'll keep forwarding packets. And then when he comes back up again, you don't have to go through the whole process of building a whole relationship from scratch and relearning all the routes. It's, it's basically a, a way that when something fails, the routes can still be maintained like an, in a cache. And then when, once the guy comes back up again, you check with him real quickly. You say, hey, these routes that I've got, are they still good? And he can either say, yes, they're still good, in which case you haven't lost anything. You haven't, your routes haven't been deleted. They've been usable the whole time in your routing table. That's typically what nonstop forwarding is. It, it's a way of, of recovering from some sort of a failure much more quickly than destroying all the routes and having to relearn everything from scratch. Mohammed has a good question and a good concern. Uh, it says, nowadays everything is migrating to software-defined networks. So I'm a little scared that I should focus on my CCNP exam. Well, think of it this way. If I said to you, you don't have to know anything about the Cisco iOS command line. You don't have to know about. It. I'm going to give you, I'm going to sit you down in front of this server that has a GUI in front of it. And using this GUI, you can reach out and it can discover all the routers and switches in your network. And you can use this GUI to program them. Now, here's what I want you to do. Using the GUI, I want you to program the following IPv6 subnets on everything. I want you to configure um, EIGRP across everywhere. Oh, I want you to use EIGRP authentication. Um, it, so what I'm getting at is, how do you know how to use the GUI if you don't know how the fundamental protocol works? For example, if, if you're not familiar with how route filtering works in OSPF, let's take OSPF as an example. OSPF has a lot of rules and restrictions about what routers can do filtering, what routers can do summarization, what routers can't. Even if you don't know the iOS command line and you're working purely with a controller that has a GUI in front of it, you still have to know those rules. If in the controller you select a router and from a drop down menu you say, I want to do filtering and this is the range of networks I want to filter. Well, if you don't know the rules about how OSPF works, you may have just selected a router that is incapable of filtering and can't do what you want it to do. But your GUI doesn't know that. Your GUI will take it, take what you selected in the menu, it'll convert that into commands, it'll push those commands down to that router, and you may not ever be aware that the commands you just pushed down didn't do anything. So you, even if you don't know the actual commands, you still have to know the theory behind how all these protocols and features work. Otherwise, the GUI is completely useless to you. Um, so, you know, even when software defined networking becomes the norm, you're still gonna have to know the theory, you're still gonna have to know the protocols, but that's still a ways off. Uh, for now, and for the next f few years at least, 
you will still have to know the Cisco iOS command line. Uh, the GUIs for software-defined networking are still evolving. And a lot of those GUIs don't do everything. Uh, you know, like a lot of times when you use a, a, a controller, it can't do all the stuff you could do if you knew the command line. In the command line, there's all sorts of bells and whistles and tweaks you could do that they just haven't written into the GUI yet. So that's another reason why it's just a good idea to know the command line very, very well. Uh, Mubashir, you ask a good question. Why has Cisco included 20% of security technologies like DHCP snooping, dynamic ARP inspection, storm control in the routing and switching exam? I think it's because they realize that in today's networks, there are a lot of attacks. There are attacks coming from outside. There are network attacks coming from inside. A lot of times employees are just fooling around and they don't even know what they're doing and they end up unintentionally generating a network attack. So you have to know security technologies at a very basic to harden your network, to secure your network. Even if your goal is not to become a security expert in today's networks, if you don't know these security, these security technologies, your network is wide open to denial of service attacks and all kinds of bad stuff. So I, I think that's why they put it in there because they just recognize that it's just a necessity in today's networks, even on routing and switching exams, that you know something about security. Let's see what else. A lot of technical questions in here that, uh, that yes, I agree, that, that uh, watching our videos or, or Googling would probably be a better forum for answering those types of questions. I think we have time for one or two more questions. We've already gone about 30 minutes over what we were supposed to, but that's okay. I'm glad to be of help to you guys. Let's see if there's one or two more uh, certification-related questions that I can help you with. Where, where can we get lab examples for CCIE? Uh, well, I'll just speak here for us here at i &E. So once again, let me just remind you, in the event that you tuned in late, that we have a 25% off right now for all of our boot camps. So if you're preparing for your CCIE, or certainly if you're preparing for your CCNP or CCNA, I would recommend you come to one of our boot camps and in the month of April, you'll get 25% off the price of that boot camp. And there's a lot of boot camps here available. Uh, personally, I teach the CCNA and the CCNP routing and switching boot camps. So I'd love to have you come to those. Uh, but in addition to that, we have workbooks for for a CCIE level as well as CCNA and CCNP. If I go into my members account, you will see here under workbooks. So for routing and switching, a lot of CCIE level workbooks. We also have it for um, service provider CCIE level. We have it for security CCIE. And clearly if you rent time on our racks and pair it up with these workbooks, this is a good way for you to prepare for your CCIE lab as well. Time for one more question. Let's see what else we have here. All right, last question here, uh, I'll answer as Arslan's last question. Do we need to study MPLS for the CCNP? Not for the CCNP routing and switching track. Certainly if you're going for a CCNP service provider, that would be a whole different story. Uh, but there, there were no questions on CCNP route or CCNP switch or T-shoot related 
to MPLS. So you don't have to worry about that in the routing and switching realm. I don't remember seeing any questions there. Now let me just check real quick here in the blueprint. I'm pretty sure, let's just look. Oops. CCMP route, 300, it's definitely not in switch, I know that. And distribution protocol, it would show up probably under layer two. No, it's not there. It's not network principles. Um, Static routing protocol types, VRF, policy-based routing, suboptimal routing, RIP, EIGRP, OSPF, nothing there. Yeah, I don't, it, it's not in the blueprint anywhere, and I don't recall seeing any MPLS questions in route. Okay. All right, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and close this up for today for our session. We do this every single month. Uh, so if you had some questions that weren't answered, join us again in May uh, for our next CCNA, CCNP Q&A session. Um, if you're wondering when they are, just sign up for a free member's account. If you don't have a member's account at i &E, it's real easy to get one. It's absolutely free. I'll show you how to get it. Just go to INE.com and click on login. It'll prompt you to create an account. It's just a username and a password and your email address. That's basically it. And then once you've got an INE members account, you can just go to members.ine.com. And this takes you to what's called our members dashboard. And right on the front of it here is our calendar of all of our classes, both our boot camps as well as our uh, live online classes. And so if you go into May, you can see that on May 3rd, I'm gonna be doing my next CCNA kickoff session. And on May 8th is when we're having our next Q&A session like we had today. Okay. All right, everybody. It has been my pleasure to be with you today. I appreciate all of your questions. You guys were a great audience. I really appreciate your questions. And uh, for those of you who are pursuing your certifications, best of luck to you. Feel free to use me as a resource. I hope our videos and workbooks and stuff are useful to you. I'm always open to hearing comments about you know, how we can improve or what we're doing well or where we're falling short. Please let me know. And I hope to see you in a future session. So have a great week and have a great weekend, everyone. And I'll see you soon.